Hi everybody, it's me, I'm Matt Halls of Comics Unlimited, located inside the Big E Superstore at 1540 Van Avenue here in Evansville, Indiana, open the first and third weekends of every month, and uh, three days on the first of the month, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and two days on the third of the month, Saturday and Sunday, also located right beside the sister store, right next door, the Big E2, which is open every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, so that's a little plug I always want to put in there. And also, oh, Matt Hall's here of The Happy Show, the long-running public access TV show. I guess eight years is long-running, right? If you survive beyond five years as a TV show, you are primed for syndication. <laughs> Not that that's been syndicated. And you can see, of course, on this channel and my other sister channel for the Happy Show stuff. I think that's youtube.com slash a happy show. And I forget what, what my my particular <laughs> particular uh, email, uh, not email, uh, what am I going for? Uh, domain, whatever. Anyway, you can find out the link because I'm sure it's on the profile page to this channel too. I don't think I changed that. If you want to check out my other sister channel which has other happy show stuff and other stuff from time to time. Okay so there's an introduction that most people who follow this on a regular basis are probably sick of hearing but just like any other channel I have to have an introduction of sorts to let people catch up to speed who haven't been following the channel regularly. That said that note it and that out of the way I'm going on to another subject. I'm going to try and make this a shorter video than I have lately as far as vlogs go. And I'm not, go, I'm not going to go into my letters that I was going to just yet. The letters and stuff that I had retained from my days as a comic book shop, a brick and mortar shop. I still resell them, as I do at the flea market. But, uh, but there was many, many years, about two decades worth of me running a shop and uh, have all that, that correspondence and stuff of publishers and stuff that I've retained that I will share again in the, in the next uh, vlog, more almost certainly in the next vlog. I took a little bit of break here. I did a Mickey Mouse vlog, uh, literally a Mickey Mouse vlog last, uh, and uh, before that I did my other vlog that dealt with whatever I was rambling about that day. <laughs> I think it was about copyrights and, and other stuff too, uh, which ties in the Steamboat Willie stuff I was mentioning. I decided to test my test the waters there just because I can, because I use some public domain footage of of uh, Steamboat Willie, which is now is public domain. We can all use it how we see fit. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, if I sound a little gleeful, uh, nothing against this. I'm not there's Disney has its detractors. I'm not really a Disney detractor. But there is still this thing where it's kind of annoying that things rightfully fall in the public domain after a good amount of years. And certainly past the uh, time the, uh, with the corporation that uh, it should have done after a certain point. Because it's, well, especially when the creators are dead anyway. What's why? I mean, I don't feel for cold, soulless corporations to be able to exploit the works of people you know, beyond their deaths. Uh, just for profit and gain indefinitely whenever it is something that could benefit the whole community by sharing with into that. Uh, so I am for things going into public domain within a certain amount of time, certainly. And Disney fault like doggedly over the years I kept extending this thing. This, this, this that should have been public domain literally decades ago. I would have still had my shop back whenever it should have been the public domain. I would have been just starting my shop when it should have been in the, in the public domain. Anyway, regardless, I'm not going to carry on about that, but I'm just saying as a, you know, so I made that video and I use some of that footage that's in the public domain and there you are. Okay, so let me get to the focus of this video. So on Facebook, uh, there's a Golden Age comic book group that, I'm, that I participate in and uh, have fun looking at the different posts. And somebody posted a whole bunch of coverless books and... It got to a discussion in the comments about retailers being newsstand retailers, which is not strictly speaking only a newsstand, uh, you know, uh, thing, but but newsstand in the sense that grocery stores and some bookstores that aren't considered specialty shops and uh, other places carry what you call newsstand convenience stores and all that. That's newsstand 
uh, di distribution. Dis you're saying distribution is distributed to those to those sorts of retailers, I should say. So there's this, that's distinct from this direct market distribution, which especially in the comic book market is something that came up, came to being in the 70s, uh, where we would have direct market sales and such, that especially, uh, especially shops, predominantly comic book shops could get comic books from a, from a, a direct, direct market distributor, such as Diamond Comics, used to be Kapler Comics, Bud Plant, and a whole bunch of others. And um, and they back in those days, especially uh, you know, you would sell those on and then get them on non-returnable basis if you're a retailer. Now let me explain about what's the deal about returnable. Okay, if going back to newsstand because that's predominantly what I'm going to discuss in this video. Per, newsstand distribution was set up so that um, I guess you know the, in the day they went they went the publishers and such wanted to encourage retailers to order their stuff of course you know they, that's the whole point they want you to order the stuff as a retailer so you as a retailer can sell it to the general public which is your customers as a retailer now the publisher you, when you buy a book a magazine or anything any kind of product like that you are the manufacturer or the publisher's customer in the broadest sense if it wasn't for you of course then they wouldn't be able to sell stuff you wouldn't want their product but really in a sense we're the middlemen as retailers when I was a retailer and distributors are a way to get it to us. You know, the publisher or the manufacturer in the case of other kinds of items, they make the product, they make it for an audience, but they need to get it to that audience. Most of the time, the manufacturer or the publisher is not the distributor. There's a distributor that handles it and they'll handle several different clients, several different manufacturers, several different publishers, and they will get that product from that manufacture a publisher in the hands of the retailer who gets it in the hands of you the consumer if you're a consumer and not a retailer or a distributor or a publisher or a manufacturer okay so you understand the chain there and most of you might you know have already known all that but again i want to get this all clear so we all understand where what i'm talking about and what's being discussed here so Direct market distribution in the comic book industry did not exist, like I said, until the 70s. Prior to that, and I'm not going to get into the history of the direct market, this is really exclusively has to do with newsstand distribution and more accurately or more particularly, particularly, I can't talk today. Anytime I can't talk. No, uh, it's really more focusing on remainder and stripped covers for the whole point of the fact that what provoked me to do this was the blog, or not blog, the post on the, in that group of a guy who had a bunch of coverless comics and was also acknowledging that, oh, a lot of people might laugh about this. No, no, I, he's talking about the fact that he goes after coverless books. I think that's great. You know, as a purist, uh, it, it shows that he's also a purist. It's not just about the value. In that case, it's almost, almost not about the value at all. I mean, arguably, there's a lot of coverless books to really super expensive key issues that are hard to get now that people will still give good money, even if it's just missing a cover or it's missing some pages. But predominantly speaking, coverless books are deemed almost like worthless, but they're not really in the strictest sense. They still have the whole story there. You can still read a whole comic book. Uh, and even if sometimes if they're missing a page, if it's an older book, which were written more like anthologies, even with the same character, you might have three stories within the book of the same character or of the of different characters. So even if you're missing a page or two, you might still be able to have at least two out of three stories complete or that sort of thing. So there is merit to keeping and going after colorless books. And sometimes if you're willing to do that, it's going to save you a lot of money if you just want to have the real deal and be able to read it, especially when we're talking about some publications that were probably never reprinted or not reprinted often and the reprints may not be easily able to find or whatever. So anyway, so the talking about the coverless books got me thinking about the newsstand distribution and about this whole subject of remainder copies. So I was explaining about the re or the distribution and the retailers and all that so that you will understand what happened is the publishers would want in this case of comic books, we're talking about publishers, not manufacturers. Though they manufacture comics, but they publish it, you know. Uh, so publishing comic books, like any other situation similar to that, 
they want to reach their audience. So, and then of course they, uh, they, the, them and the distributor who's there, who's, you know, responsible for getting their books out to the hands of the retailers want the retailers to want their product and they then to encourage retailers to try their product to sell to the, to the public. What they would do is make some things on a returnable basis. That's why they're returnable. So that way a shop would be like, well, okay, I'll take a chance. I'll order the, you know, those magazines and such. If, if you're saying I can't, I can return it and get a credit if it doesn't sell which is what was being done and what is still done to this day in newsstand new distribution. So I would order as a retailer X amount of books, or in this case with newsstand distribution, you don't really get to pick single, single uh, uh, the amounts of single titles or whatever you get a bundle. But as a newsstand, this, the newsstand retailer, you generally aren't concerned with, uh, because you're not a specialist, you're not a specialty shop. You're not concerned with, getting X amount of Spider-Man, X amount of this or X amount of that. You do want to carry a book that's selling well. So you want those popular titles, but you usually get a mixed allotment. Of, you know, they would send you to, to you in a bundle. So you don't normally get to choose every issue and, and uh, every title necessarily. And certainly not every, how many copies of every issue as a rule for new stain distribution. So, but again, they're returnable too. So you could give a chance more to titles you weren't sure about. See, that's in their way, way this plays out. The reason you're being sent uh, these other things, these other publications, even though you specifically may not think they would sell for you, is because the distributor retailer is saying, don't worry about it. If it don't sell, just send it back. We'll give you credit. So that's why that system is in place. So, uh, Again, not going into the whole thing about the uh, comic book uh, direct market distribution, but one of the reasons it got started is us uh, in the direct market, us, uh, we who are retailers as such, uh, you know, went, well, uh, again, not the whole story, but Phil Suling, one of the chief instruments of, of that uh, direct market, went and want to be able to pick how many copies and such. So we, as an industry, as a, as a comic book industry retail of retailers, said, don't worry about making it returnable. And that enticed the publishers because the thing is we were, see, I am getting a little bit into the tricks thing, but just to explain this part. And I might have said this in a previous video too, a little bit. So that appealed to the publishers and distributor too, you know, because uh, even though it was a different distributor, you're done with direct market distributors, it set up a new distribution system. But the publishers were keen on that idea because they're like, wait a minute, so you order X amount of copies, we allow you, we allow you to order specific amounts of each of each how you want, and then we also allow you to order which titles you want, with, and you don't have to order, you don't have to take all this other stuff. But whatever doesn't sell, you eat, in a sense. If it doesn't sell, you're stuck with it. You're not going to return it to us. You're not going to expect us to credit you. And that's what the comic book retailers said, basically. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that, sure. And so it makes it a little bit more of a tricky game if you're a comic book retailer because you got to guess what will sell because you can't return it if it doesn't. You eat it, in a sense. Now, it sometimes it can become back market, uh, or back issue sales that will move. Sometimes they never move for the retailing. You've in effect lost on that. It's a gamble. And that's a whole nother story again. So again, I'll leave that there because I under, so, so now I've explained what the distinction is to some degree between the direct market and the newsstand market. But the newsstand market, again, you don't get a choice on the titles necessarily and certainly not the amount of each title. And part of that is because it's returnable so, and that's the way for publishers and all to encourage you to try to put out the other stuff to see what will fly. Of course, if you get too many returns, if they get too many returns and unsold books, on, in other words, then they realize, oh, that book ain't selling. So that's when they cancel it and so on and so forth. So, when it comes to returnable books, what, what, was, what the whole deal is, instead of having retailers send the whole comic, which I don't know for sure, but perhaps in the very beginning, the new stand distribu distributors would not require, or, or perhaps they did require rather, that publishers, or I'm getting us all mixed up, 
The distributors, I think, may have required in the beginning that the retailers who had unsold stock send them the whole deal, the whole comic or the whole magazine, such as the case may have been. But if that was in the, ever the case in the very beginning, it may have been. Uh, I should know this, but but it certainly evolved even by the 40s already to where you didn't have to send the whole book because this is going to be on the dime of the publisher and distributor. I'm not sure. I guess it's the publisher ultimately deals with the cost on that. Uh, that would be logical, I guess. But regardless, both the publisher and the distributor, it's cost on their dime, in a sense, for you to return it. You know, Because they're telling you as a retailer, hey, it's returnable if it don't sell, so please order it, right? So so that since it was on their dime, they thought, you know, God dang it, we just want proof that they have sold this thing. Do we need the whole book? No. On the principle that more likely somebody isn't going to be able to sell something that's missing part of its... Uh, packaging, so to speak. So if you're selling a comic book and it's de devoid of its cover, as a rule, one would think, okay, well, it's, in effect, worthless again. So, I mean, it's a, it's chance of being sold are lessened, certainly, even before the age of where collectability was a factor, just because people, generally speaking, don't want damaged goods. So, the publishers and distributors just figure, well, you know, just send us back the covers. That way it saves us the cost, but you're supposed to destroy. You need to destroy the remainder of that book. You can't resell it because you just told us it wasn't sellable for you, and now we're giving you back your money, so if we're giving you back your money, you destroy that thing. That thing's gone. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Well, and then eventually they would say, don't, why even send us a whole cover? Because paper still adds up several covers still becomes a huge bundle if there's enough of them and, and you know the weight and all that so just send us just strip the title just strip it just, just strip the title off the book so usually the first portion the first third of a comic or magazine or whatever would be tore off and, um, and then they would just send that so sometimes you'll see coverless books that were remainder copies maybe they were remainder maybe some kid destroyed the cover or just got loose or it fell off, whatever the case may be, if you find a coverless book, though a good chunk, were what they call remainder copies, i.e. returned copies. But, if you received one with a third, especially that top half neatly cut off, it definitely was a remainder copy. There's maybe the small chance that just some fan really just wanted to cut the logo part off of it. But as a rule, it was that that is almost certainly a remainder copy, even more so than a coverless copy. But one or, the, or, one, or both of those versions are what's, what's done to return your books, if you're a retailer. <laughs> so, again, those, those coverless books, or even nearly coverless books, weren't supposed to be resold. But they were sold quite a bit by a lot of different mom and pop shops, grocery stores, department stores, convenience stores, all those. There's there's some of them, not all of them did it, but some of them thought, you know, when I throw it aside, I can put this book cost a dime, I'll put a nickel or two cents. Back in the day when that could still amount to a little something. Uh, they just go ahead and put it on the stand at two or three, two to five cents or something like that. About half or less of what it cost uh, with the cover. And so that sometimes that would work, and people would buy those because you know without the cover, the covers are cool. But especially if you're just buying because you want to read it, and then it's particularly in the age when collecting for profit was not really a thing because nobody thought comic books would be worth anything anyway. They were fine, you know. Kids certainly would find to read to get the read the you know Daffy Duck or Superman, and be able to read the gist of the adventure even if it was missing its cover. And same with adult fans as well. You know, uh, so so that's the market there. Now, I have never heard that there, even though there was some publications like the Overstreet uh, Price Guide and other books, because this is, goes into the book market as well as magazines and comics, where it will say, if this is sold without a cover, it has been stolen or it's been sold illegally or whatever. I used to read, see those when I was a kid and go, oh my God, what's this about? Didn't understand the whole distribution situation. 
and then realized what a, didn't know anything about what a remainder book was at that point in time. But that's what that's about. They're, now the comic books and stuff don't usually have that notification, but some books you may have seen that in, and and uh, books you know that's that's basically saying, hey, listen, they claimed it was stolen and they still sold it. Also, books as a rule are a higher price point, which is probably why a lot of these uh, publishers would put print that in there because they're like, damn it. We're charging a lot for this book if they're claiming it. Where comic books were always, especially in the beginning, meant to be affordable, cheap, mass entertainment. Back when it was mass entertainment, selling to literally in the millions. Uh, before it became a niche market, especially market. So, whenever they sold these comic books to the likes of the retailers back in those days, and the retailer claimed it was unsold, and returned the cover or whatever, but still sold the um, the coverless version. They usually weren't going to the publishers and stuff. Usually didn't go after them. As far as I know, they never went after them. I don't, I'm sure maybe in the history at some point they did, but as a rule, I don't. I've never heard any grand story about how there was these busts over that sort of thing. Because really, the the. The distributor and the publisher could claim it unsold on taxes. They got their write-off, you know, for a loss. The other place didn't get its full amount. I mean, it, it but it still made up on because they had, you sold the remainder of the book for a discounted price. But that amounted more or less to pocket change. And if the practice was so widespread or so, it was widespread arguably. But if it was such to such a volume that it really impacted on the publishers, like say. You couldn't, based on what I'm getting at, you couldn't be a retailer and always claim all your books weren't sold and strip them and sell and get your credit back and then sell to the people. You couldn't do that on a, any real volume because at some point the publisher or the distributor, it ain't a matter even, you know, you're going to jail for it. It's simply they'll be like, well, your, your reporting those losses, they'll cut you off. They're not going to make, if they're making money, you're costing them money and it's a consistent, regular thing. They're gonna cut you off, so it's not even a matter of having to go to you know to lawsuits or anything over that sort of thing because we're basically talking nickel, literally at the time nickels and dimes and less, um, you know, because the highest retail on a comic book that was the regular page count was a dime. So and even though that was a, still a bit more money back in those days, it still was considered affordable entertainment. So basically, what I'm getting at is there wasn't any real money to be had, and it. it really was some amount of the pocket change. The reason those stores did it is they just thought, why, why pitch this property product that I can still get a little something out of, even though I know technically I'm not supposed to do that. But it wasn't like this grand money making scheme. And and again, if it were to a certain volume, they would have been cut off anyway. So. That's why I don't think it was a big issue with the distributors and publishers to the point that they made such a stink about it. They just literally rolled it off. And uh, and then, you know, the retailers did what they did, and the kids and all them had their, you know, got their cheaper comics and stuff. And that is that basic history. I'm going to pretty much wrap this up now because that's the gist of what I was going to talk about anyway. I didn't know this. That this video, while it's going to be maybe a, almost 10 minutes shorter than my other uh, last few vlogs, it's still lengthier than I was expecting. But anyway, that's that's the history to the degree, a uh, general history of that system, newsstand distribution, how it works in pertaining to the comic book industry and return comics. I hope you enjoy it if you stuck with it. Like, subscribe, and share, and all that fun stuff, and ring the bell. No, I don't <laughs> The notifications, I don't know if that even applies to my videos. I'm not monetized. But anyway, thanks, and I'll see you next time. Yay!